I have 705. I say we get going. What do you say? I say let's start. Okay. Well, welcome everybody to this Zoom live call. Um, we're so appreciative that you're here. We hope to have a lot of fun and have some interaction. So my name is Patricia Daker. I am the owner and founder of a company called Better Diabetes Life. I live with type 1 diabetes since 1991, so 30-something more years. Um, I am a registered nurse, a board-certified nurse coach, which means I am I do nurse coaching, and then it has a holistic sort of uh, flair, body, mind, and spirit to looking at all aspects of self. What else did I want to say? Um, this is being recorded, so we will try to post this later, so you can rewatch if um, you're re catching this on the rewatch. We'll do that. And what else? Um, we will have some polls. You're invited to attend and answer those questions, and then we'll have chat um, questions that we want you to participate with as well. So one more thing before I hand it over to Chaka. So part of what we're doing tonight is um, offering you some special opportunities, and I am going to be conducting a research project. So I have a program online called um, Better Diabetes Life Five Step Program. It's a video um, coaching course, and I need to do some research. And so um, our facilitator, the beautiful Miss Odessa, is in the background helping us out. She's going to offer a web link on there. And if you're interested, as we talk through this, of perhaps joining this research project and doing some of the online video coaching, um, you can fill out that form, give me your contact information, answer a few questions. And then um, if you meet criteria, we'll, we'll talk to you about joining this research project. So you'll get free coaching. It's free to, um, to join, no cost to you. All right. So... Oh, just, it, yeah, we just put there's that link. That's just an online survey to fill that out. And I would like to introduce also my friend Chaka Jackson. We had the good fortune of meeting through another fellow type one who saw each other's pumps and tech gear and said, hey. And so um, we were introduced and we've gotten to know each other. And we said, we're going to come on live and um, just talk about things. And so Chaka, why don't you introduce yourself? Well. Again, I'm Chaka Jackson, and I am a type 1 diabetic. I am also a hairstylist, and um, let's see, also work for Southwest Airlines as well. Let's see, um, I also have two daughters, two beautiful daughters, Jasmine and Mackenzie, ages 25 and 18. I am the founder and owner of Diabetic Social. So Diabetic Social is my nonprofit um, foundation that... I put together like maybe like two years ago. So um, Diabetic Social was created to bring diabetics together to um, have to help educate, which is something that I did not have when I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. But um, I am the founder and owner of that. And I'm also a former Tennessee Titans cheerleader. I cheer hey. for the Titans. <laughs> I cheer for the Titans for like five seasons. So. Yeah, that was interesting being a diabetic and a cheerleader too. That was a whole nother world within itself, but awesome. yes. Yeah. Very cool. So we said we want to make this interactive. And so we're going to launch a poll. We want to hear about your type of diabetes. So Odessa is going to pop something on your screen and you can answer that question. Um, and then we'll just see who's all here and what's going on. So I think it's always interesting um, when we talk about a struggle, Right, the struggle doesn't really, to me, it's not as important whether it's type one or type two, because the struggle is the struggle. There are hardships when your pancreas isn't doing what it's supposed to do. Um, and Odessa, you tell us when or pop up the results when you feel like everybody's answered the poll. Okay, so what do we have? We have 60% are type one, 20% are family or um family or friend, and some, one person has no correlation. So that's pretty cool. Well, thank you all for joining. I would imagine as more and more folks join and you know everybody's always late to these things. So um, that's kind of cool. So we're a little type one group here and family and friends of, so that's pretty cool. You know, if we talk about type one, right? Type one is an autoimmune disease where your immune system attacks the beta cells in your pancreas and you are unable to produce insulin. And so insulin management therapy is required by injection, by a pump. Somehow you've got to take and um, replace that insulin for the rest of your life. 
with type two, you're making insulin, but you're very resistant to it. It's more of a metabolic condition. And you can take oral medications to try to stimulate your pancreas to make more insulin or to make you more sensitive to insulin or to slow down the absorption of carbs. There's all these things that we try to do, but both conditions end up with the inability to regulate your sugar, your glucose naturally, and we get high levels in the blood. So even though they're different um, diseases by pathophysiology, it still requires a lot of, um, of work and hardship, right? So um, I think there's, Shaka, you wanna add anything to that? Um, I would add it, you're right, it does. It requires a lot of attention on both ends. Um, and with my personal experience, um, I wish I had that to know the difference between type one and type two, because I thought all diabetes was the same. So um, just knowing the difference that one is insulin dependent and one is not, um, is that was very educational for me up front and to help me know more of what my body was doing as a type one diabetic. Right. Because it's different, right? It's very different. And we all have to check our sugar and monitor and things like that. So when I was diagnosed, I was a registered nurse. I knew all the stuff. I knew everything about it. I saw people every day. And one would think that because I knew all that, I wouldn't struggle. And that was not my case. I really did struggle. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that um, as we get into this content. But Chaka, tell me about your biggest struggle. What was the biggest hardship for you? My biggest hardship was except in the fact that I had to live with a chronic illness for the rest of my life. Um, that was pretty hard because as an adult, your whole life changes in a matter of a moment. And you don't know what to do. You know, everybody's looking at you like you're, you're sick, and you, but you don't feel sick, but still, you know, not knowing what's going on with my body, but just uh, had to change the paradigm in my mind that, I had to take shots. I had to check my blood sugar every single day for the rest of my life was a struggle to, um, to accept. And also food was a struggle for me because I love food. I love to eat. I love to just indulge in everything. <laughs> so, you know, um, having to watch what I eat and how to, how it affected my blood sugars was a struggle for me to get control of. I mean, I had blood sugars all over the place and not having an understanding of how as to why your blood sugar needs to stay at a certain level. It was all a struggle. So okay. it did not have a proper education. So you shared with me too, um, kind of the, one of the reasons for creating Diabetic Social was that, you know, even in your community, you felt like you didn't come across a lot of other type ones in the African-American community. There's a confusion because there's so much type two and you had type one and you felt sort of not, you know, like, like it didn't work for you. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Well, yeah. Um, growing up, of course, um, in the African-American community, we call it the sugar. So, you know, you had the sugar and it was mainly people who were like overweight. So I was taught that diabetes, you could, if you changed your diet and your exercise, your diabetes could be reversed. That's the only diabetes I've ever heard about. I've been around all that. But when I was diagnosed with type, with type one, I literally, I told the doctor, I said, well, just give me about a month and um, I'm gonna go exercise a little more. I'm gonna change my diet and it'll be gone in about a month. But they're looking at me like, no. But I wasn't listening to them. They wasn't telling me my pancreas wasn't, was, you know, was producing little to no insulin. But, you know, um, but growing up in, in my community, that's why I was around type twos. I didn't realize that there were different types of diabetes. I thought it all was the same. So not having an education or having someone to properly tell me this is what's going on with your body, this is what this is, you know, I didn't know. I struggled with that. So me thinking that it was going to reverse sooner than later, that was, that right. was hard for me when I was still waking up with having to take <laughs> shots every day because yeah, I'm scared I'm of needles. See, what people don't know, I'm scared of needles. Right. I don't know that. too many people that really like them, right? It's I had like to get over that fear them. real quick. <laughs> I had to get yeah, over that. You have to. But yeah, but just knowing that um, once I started educating myself and finding out more things about how to control your diabetes, 
um, I was learning that it wasn't in our community like that. You know, it wasn't, I couldn't understand why we didn't know like, about CGMs and, you know, the insulin pumps to that degree. So that's what made me form Diabetic Social to actually get the awareness, the education out there so for it, not just that, but for everybody, you know, to know was how to properly manage your diabetes and live a more healthy, healthier life. Yeah, that's awesome. I think a couple, you hit on some really good points about isolation, like feeling un, uninformed and different from everybody else. That's certainly, and then that denial, like this is not what's happening to me, right? Feeling like, no, 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 that, you know, that's not how this is going to play out. I think that's very common. Um, and I think no matter what community you're in, it, it makes you feel different, right? And there's often not a lot of people like you, no matter what, sometimes it takes a while to meet somebody else with your particular type of diabetes, whether it's type one or type two. So, um, yes. yeah. So yesterday, I believe I finally met another type one years later. And that was crazy to me because I was like, am I the only one? I cannot be the only one out here in the world with yeah. type one diabetes. But yeah. yeah, it was like years later before I met another type. Absolutely. And that's a heavy burden, right? That's a heavy psychological yeah, burden yeah, to be that alone. alone right? That's a struggle. So let's talk to our participants. If y'all want to use the chat, share with us some of your struggles, any particular hardships that you've had, um, you know, things that were really difficult for you to, to work through or to come to understand, like, um, and I know some people are on the phone, so it's going to be hard, but yeah, if you feel like sharing anything of, um, of your own struggle, like what was, what has been hard for you and maybe even how you overcome it. And I'm going to scroll a little bit while you all are typing so we can see what we have. Because I really want to hear from you. Like, I have I think it's important. Paula says it's overwhelming. Knowing this is a life struggle is hard. Yeah, it's a full-time job for the rest of your life with no pay and no vacation, right? None. I see where it says, what What do you think about insulin pumps? And what is this, the best type? This best, you know. So I love insulin pumps. I've been on one since 1999. Yeah. Um, it dramatically changed everything. Um, it was a mental journey. I'll say that, right? So it's a little bit different because you have a thing on your body. And so my own personal journey was I saw Miss America the year that um, Nicole Johnson was Miss America. She strutted her stuff on this stage wearing an insulin pump. And I thought, my goodness, if she can do it, I'm going to give it a shot because I was nursing and I had weird shifts. And so trying to time my injections was really hard. Um, so I was on a Medtronic pump, like a tubed pump up until a year ago. And now I'm on Omnipod, um, you know, pros and cons to both. The, the pro of a tube pump is no matter where you're at, you have that pump and you have the controller with you because you can give yourself insulin with the pump itself. With the stick-on kind of pump, you have to have your controller and you have to have it charged. So if you ever lose that thing or it's dead, you can't give yourself, an, it, it's still going to give you continuous insulin. Um, but if you want to eat food and you have to give yourself, so I guess that's another thing. An insulin pump delivers insulin 24, seven, 365 every day, all day, all the time. And then you give yourself additional insulin to either correct a high blood sugar or to counterbalance your carbs that you eat. Right. So, um, to me, it's given me much more flexibility. It was worth the trade-off. What do you think, Chaka? I, I love my insulin pump now. I, I Actually, I have the tubeless insulin pump, Omnipod, the tubeless insulin pump. I was so anti-insulin pump. I could not stand them. I did not like the tube. I learned that I did not like the tube because it made me feel like I was connected to a machine 24 hours a day. I didn't like that feeling. I didn't like it mentally. And it mentally it bothered me. But the best, the best insulin pump to me is the Omnipod. It connects with my CGM. So it's, it talks to each other. And I promise you, it's a game changer. My blood sugars, this is the best my blood sugars have been ever since I've been diagnosed for what, 25 years. This is the best my blood sugars have ever been. So um, the best insulin pump to me is the Omnipod, the tubeless. It is tubeless. I love the tubeless and yep. it connects with my CGM. So it helps managing my diabetes so much better. Those are so great much. questions. And, and, you know, online, there's a lot of, um, especially on Facebook, there's a lot of groups where you can ask people different opinions, but um, you know, a lot of times I'll let you play with one and try it on. You can just have saline going through it. So you can actually wear it before you actually have to put real insulin in it. So there's, you can kind of try before you buy if you want to. 
Great question. Let's go on to the next one. Just um, one of the struggles, just watching my mom manage her diabetes and oh, there's something in my way. I still live her best life so she can keep on being so inspiring. Yeah. Um, you know what? We got to our, our choice is to lay down and give up or to, you know, half full, half empty. And that's what I think a lot of the struggle. And we're going to talk a little bit about this in a minute. It's this journey. It's the journey of, I don't want to pump, you know, I feel deprived. So that to me has been the harder part. And Shamika says, I say, having to readjust my life and mentally prepare myself on thinking about my kids. Yeah, it's the mental game. I, and, and so my business as a coach, that's why I actually created my coaching. It's not, I don't coach people about insulin or diet, or I can tell you that if that's what you need to know, but we really talk about how to come to grips with this mental aspect, because that was my biggest barrier. Um, and it's a heavy burden. Yeah, when your when your head's not in the game, what do you think, Chaka? I think um, that was sweet. Thank you, Jess, <laughs> for that comment. Um, um, it, it is it's, it's a full mental. It's a game changer when because you have to change your mind about your whole complete your life. Period. It's not not just your life, but the people that's in your life. Like I have to live my life. For my girls, you know, they inspire me. They keep me going because, I mean, it's easy to want to give up. So you have to mentally, like, pull yourself out of things to keep going because, again, it's um, diabetes is an, a whole nother life. It's a whole nother, you know, everything else that you have to just um, control along with other things, along with just everyday life, period. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely, you know, what it weighs on you um, mentally and. Well, and it's a to. big, and it's your life and your job and your diabetes and your sleep and your food. Like it all gets impacted. It's not like you have a disease that's over here in a box, every piece and part of you. And again, if I look at a holistic body, mind, and spirit, all three of those parts of you are deeply affected. And unfortunately, our medical system just looks at the body. Get your blood sugars here, eat this, be in the box, do the right thing, and you should be good. And if you're not good, then you must be doing something wrong. There's this implied guilt, right? Um, yeah. As a nurse, a hard part. yeah, hard. as a nurse, that's kind of how you're taught that if you do all these things right, they should be okay. They being people with diabetes, and now I'm a they, right? But um, yeah, so it's really hard as people don't understand. And we're going to talk about that here in a minute. I want to um, look at comments. So talking about scary when somebody has a spell, right? A family member. So it's also not only a hardship for us, because we have to live that way, right? That's hard. But the people around us, right? They have to watch or feel helpless or feel unsure and feel scared, right? So it, it doesn't just affect you. It affects your colleagues, your coworker, your church, your community, it is pervasive, right? Yeah, yeah. It is scary. Well, thanks to all the people who um, help us out when we have those spells, right? Judith says, I became type one after surgery. Oh, so you had a pancreatectomy, meaning you lost your whole pancreas. Wow. I'm trying to read the font so big here and the injection. It's exhausting. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll talk to that really briefly for Judith. So having a pancreatectomy or pancreas removed is sort of like a double whammy because at least my pancreas, I still make glucagon. I still secrete enzymes that help with digestion. So even though my pancreas, the beta cells, which make insulin, that's what Chuck and I have to deal with, right? They, it just, the, just those particular cells don't make insulin, but a lot of the other functions um, are still there, right? So we're still secreting digestive enzymes, glucagon, as I mentioned, things like that. So yeah, so it is a double whammy, Judith, to have the whole organ gone because now you're juggling a, quite a few more things, right? So um, God bless you. That's a hard one. Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay, I think that's all the questions. Thank you all for sharing. So I want to talk to you. Um, one of the reasons why we struggle so one of the reasons, the biggest reason why we struggle is that we want here and now to be then and there. And it's, it boils down to that very simple thing. So we want, you know, I want it to be like it was. I want it to be the future when it's better. Um, and 
when we don't like what is how we are here today, it's a very hard place because that's the only place we ever are is here and now. Right. And I know that's a very high level, but it applies to so many things. Like I don't want this to be true, or I don't want other people to worry about me. I don't want to feel different. All these things that we don't want yet they, here they are. Right. And so we get in the struggle place of, I, I don't want this, right. I want something else. And as long as you don't want this and you want something else, there's struggle and dissatisfaction. So that's a really high, simple, simple explanation. I'm going to dive into it a little bit more. Um, let's see what else I want to say. Right. And so we, when we don't want something, we resist it. Right. So I don't, I don't, I don't like something. I don't want something. I don't like snakes. I stay the heck away from them. Right. So if there's something that we don't like, that's painful, that's uncomfortable, we tend to avoid them. Right. And when we avoid diabetes, it doesn't usually bode well. Chaka, do you have anything to say to add? Um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're totally right. We don't like our once you kind of, you resist it. I, I resist diabetes for the longest. Um, I didn't want to deal with it, but it made me deal with it, you know, because it becomes a matter of life or death type of deal. Um, but and when they talk about the diabetic depression, that's real. Um, yeah. But um, again, I was very resistant to it because I didn't want it. I didn't want to take medicine for the rest of my life. I didn't. I don't want to do none of this. Basically, yeah. you get to put, I don't want to do none of this. So <laughs> you just, just go away like type two, you know, <laughs> and it just disappear. <laughs> it's like, yeah, right. but, but you, but you learn to deal with it because again, the struggle is real and you just, I had to change the paradigm in my mind to yep. just be able to. Let's talk about that paradigm. It. I think that's a good transition. Let's talk about that paradigm because often we want, um, we get in a place where we focus on what's wrong, the disease, right? The problem, I have this condition, I have this thing. So I always like to talk about wellness because even though my pancreas is not the best pancreas in the world and I have technology, I don't feel unwell. And I, I do that on purpose. I focus on what works. And so there's a, a simple formula that I offer for wellness. And it's really, again, I like simple things that can kind of apply to many. So from a holistic body, mind, spirit, if you have flow in the body, good blood flow, good oxygen flow, your lymphatic system is flowing, your digestion is flowing, your blood sugar is flowing normally, that is well. That's how your body, your body's always in motion, always moving. And if you're not moving and you get stagnant, you sit around too much, we're not, you know, and I'm not talking about running marathons, but just moving and being active, right? It's healthy for your body. So flow in your body. Super important when we don't have flow, we get hypertension. We have all these other things, right? If it's not flowing, it's stagnant. Flow in the body, peace in the mind. And we're going to talk about that. So peace, right? Being stressed is not well, right? When we're worried and uptight and anxious, if we don't find ways to insert some peace into that, and luckily we have support systems and church and prayer and meditation and mindfulness. And there's a lot of things that that we can do to help cultivate peace because we live in a very worried and anxious society. So flow in the body, peace in the mind. And we have to remember that we have connection of spirit, connection to self, to universe, to God, right? To each other. Because when we live with a disease like this, it's so easy to feel isolated and that I'm different. But intrinsically, we are connected. You and I are made of the same cells, the same stuff, the same protons and neutrons as the moon, right? We are in this universe. We are of it. So we are connected that way. We're part of nature, just like the animals and the plants. We're part of that. And we are part of our relationships, right? But we forget about it, right? We forget. And when we forget that we're connected, that really feels bad, right? We get weak and tired. So Simple wellness is flow of the body, peace in your mind, and you remember that you're connected. Simple, simple things, right? So I want to talk to you. I'm going to switch, but that's just a simple little body, mind, spirit idea. But I want to ask you a question, and this is going to come out of nowhere, so I'm doing this on purpose. But um, Odessa, let's put up the next poll. Has anyone ever talked to you about 
grief with your diabetes. Has anybody ever talked about grief, grieving, and diabetes? And while you answer that, so I'm going to I'm going to answer mine like back in the day. Um, That's how I answered mine. <laughs> yeah. So do I'm reading comments again here while we're doing the poll. Wow. No, eighty six percent. This is mind blowing to me. Oh my gosh. Okay. We're going to have fun now because I, I hope that tonight for the 86% of you that you go, holy moly, why didn't somebody tell me this sooner? Um, I want to look at these comments real quick. Judah says, OMG, that is so true. I want to stop resisting and having a hard time being here now. Yeah. Let's talk about why we do that. It's grief. Oh my gosh. The reason that we resist is grief, which sounds absolutely bonkers crazy, right? So when we think about grief, it, somebody dies, right? That's the typical thing. Someone dies. And imagine when that happens, we have compassion, we have tolerance, we reach out, we, we surround them, we hold them up. We have grief because we lose something, right? So you can have grief over the loss of a loved one. Heck, you can have grief if you lose your iPhone, right? It's hot, right? Like we could, we could be that. I want to talk to you about grief when you lose this life you thought you were going to live. And that was my lesson personally for me. Like I, three years into my diabetes journey, this ER nurse who was supposed to know how to do it and I was perfectionist and I couldn't do it right. My blood sugars weren't perfect. It just made me absolutely crazy. Um, I thought I would learn in, in therapy how to be perfect. What I learned was I was grieving. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that. So always grief occurs with loss. And when you get diabetes, you lose this life that you were going to have without insulin and needles and shot and finger sticks and doctor visits and lab tests and diets, all that stuff. That life is gone. That life where you just went and ate whatever and you had a tub of ice cream and nobody cared, right? Like you actually lose that part of you. That aspect of yourself is gone. And if that's not worthy of, you know, some grief, but nobody talks about it, right? If someone lost a leg or a limb, you're like, oh my gosh, right? You lose your pancreas and they wag their finger and like, stop eating that. What are you doing, right? There, there's not that compassion and care. You feel much more judged. You feel imperfect. You feel shame because you're not doing it right, right? All of these emotions. So let's dig into grief. Anybody um, have any comments on that before we get started. So um, I'm looking at my notes real quick. Um, so I think the other thing is, along with that shame, we feel bad that we're not doing it better, right? You go to the doctor, you go to the people and they're like, do these things. Here's your plan of care, right? Take these meds, eat this way, exercise, blah, 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 do the things. And then you get home and you can't do it. Like something gets in the way, finances get in the way, your job gets in the way, you really don't want to deal with it, right? And then we're like, I suck, right? <laughs> I can't do this. This is too hard. I don't want to do it on and on and on. So it makes us feel worse and we spiral. And then what happens? They tell us we're non-compliant, right? You're bad. You're not doing your job. Your numbers should be better. And there's a lot of finger wagging. And those folks who love us want us to be okay. So they try to urge us and encourage us to be different, to be better because they want us to be healthy, which can be annoying as I'll get out. Right. So I want to talk about these and grief appears in many ways. This is just one version. So these are the kind of common stages of grief. So denial, not me. I don't have this. Mm -mm. Sound familiar, Chaka? Right. I did the same thing. Like I'm getting a second opinion, right? No, 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 no. I, right. This can't be true. This is wrong. Give me a month. I'm going to be back and I'll show you, right? Denial, exactly. right? So, and the step, second one is anger. What the heck? Who did this? Nobody told me this. How can, you know, we get angry and we start pointing, look, you get mad at the doctor, you get mad at your family and friends. Um, and there's a reason for that. And then we do bargaining and it's like this, like this dance that we do. Well, I'll do that. I'll eat that, but I won't do that. Or I'll talk to him. I won't talk to her. I'll listen to you and not to you, you know, and I'll, so one of my, I still do this. I will eat a cookie and take insulin, but I will never drink a real soda. I don't know why soda is just not worth it, but there's these, this dance that we do of bargaining of how does this work now? I'll try this on. That doesn't fit. I don't like it. Right. Then we get into depression and it's like, oh my God, it's not going away. 
this sucks. Like really, this just sucks, right? And it's very, very sad. And then if we maneuver through all that, we get to this place called acceptance. Acceptance doesn't mean that you agree. Acceptance means that you see that it's true. Don't mean you like it. You just notice that this is real. All of those emotions, just in general, people tend to get mad at us. They don't understand them. We feel like, how come I'm such a huh, right? How come I'm such a hot mess? I want to tell you why these feelings are important and they're meaningful and they're useful. And when we understand them, that's how we navigate through. So first is denial. Denial gives you pause to think, right? Imagine if everything that came at you, you disagreed with out of the blue, right? So denial is like, wait, wait, what? Is this? And, and it pulls you back from that situation. It pulls you away from the emotion and you get a chance to process. You're like, is this true? Wait, what, right? That pause is healthy and good, right? Now it's not good if we're doing it 10 years later and we're still not there, but denial in of itself as a first stage of grieving gives us a place and a space to back up, to get perspective, right? So sometimes perspective, a good example of perspective is the feeling that you feel sitting in a traffic jam versus the feeling that you feel if you're in a 10-story building looking down at the freeway, right? Being in it so much worse than being way back over here. So that pause gives us perspective. So that denial, if you now realize, oh, that's why I'm doing that. This is my time to think, to ponder, to get back, to understand and get out of the, the guts of it, right? Get out of the hotbed. So denial is purposeful, right? When we know. And anger, right? Then anger comes and it's like, I'm mad. Well, anger is what stirs us to action because anger and Chaka, I'm going to pick on you as we go through. Chaka's like, I'm going to go do something about this, right? I'm going to go find this out, right? And it, and it stirs you to action because how come nobody told me this? Somebody should have told me, right? And so anger, anger is about an unmet need on a psychological level. It's always about an unmet need. There's something you need to feel safe, to feel understood, to be seen, to be valued, you know, to understand there's some need that you have that you're not getting and it makes you angry. But anger stirs you to action. So when you're angry, and you're like, what do I need? Once you understand the need, that's how you work through the anger. Bargaining, number three, we will do bargaining for the rest of our life. So unfortunately, diabetes is not a flat disease. It goes all over the place, right? So we just when we get it figured out, it does something different, right? It, it goes sideways. So we're always having to adjust, right? A new piece of tech, you go through menopause, you have a baby, you do a thing. Like there's just always this constant adjusting. So I want you to think of bargaining, like trying on clothes. Sometimes your weight goes up and you got to go try on a new pair of jeans. Sometimes your weight goes down. You got to try something different on this bargaining process of seeing what works is how you learn the better way and what works for you. So it's perfect. It's not that you're being crazy or you're schizophrenic or, you know, you can't make up your mind. You're trying to see what lands with you or is depression. And let me tell you, having an organ fail is worthy of some sadness. Having your life inextricably changed is worthy of sadness. It's worthy of other people recognizing your sadness, right? And often we don't get that because we're just expected to kind of move forward and go do it, right? And so we're trying to be strong. We're trying to be brave. We're putting on the face, but inside it's just a hot mess, right? And nobody sees that. So this depression time when we cry and we mourn, and we wish it were different, but we come to realize it's not. It has purpose, right? When we get to acceptance, right? We've gone through all that stuff and we realize why we were doing what we were doing. We're like, well, of course, I'm not crazy. It's normal. I had extreme loss. Denial's normal. Anger's normal. Bargaining's normal. Depression and sadness is normal. We just don't want to get stuck in any of those, right? So that's what happens. So I'm going to pause here. I know I just said a ton, but when we get to acceptance, acceptance is this is me, right? It's like, okay, this is what I got. I can't undo it. And I'm going to just be my best version of myself. And again, it doesn't mean I agree or that I wanted this or I brought it upon myself. I just, this is where we notice here and now, and we let go of there and then, right? Okay. I just said a whole bunch. That's like, three coaching sessions in 10 minutes. So, um, 
Oh, th thank you, Odessa, for typing up those notes. Yeah. What do y'all think about that? Does that resonate, Chaka? I know we've, I kind of picked on you because as in listening to you talk, like we go through these stages, but we don't often give ourselves grace or understanding of that's actually what we're doing. Well, you, I stayed in denial for a long time. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, you're right. We don't give ourselves the grace or the, um, or the, or celebrate when, you know, we, we are having a good day because I guess I never wanted to look at diabetes as it being a, um, um, kind of like, you know, like you use it for an excuse for things or, yeah. you know, people see as you use it for an excuse, but, um, denial. Yeah. All those steps that, I mean, that is correct. I mean, I, I went through the depression part of it, um, to where I was just ready to give up a lot of times. I mean, but, you know, again, you think about, I thought about my daughters and, you know, you only get one mom, you know, so you bring yourself, I brought myself up out of it, but you do, you, you go there and you kind of stay for a minute. And it's like, I'm not trying to take any more medicine. I'm not trying to prick my finger again. I just don't want to do none of it no more, but I brought myself out of it, but, um, yeah. and then you learn to accept it and accepting came with, um, getting knowledge on what it is that I had, you know, what really is, what is type one diabetes? How do I live with this? How do I take control of this? And um, educating myself. So, and coming across the CGMs, the pumps, the things that help, help you to manage, you know, your diabetes, it does, it takes a load off just the mental part of it, the depression and stuff, because I was living with like just bottoming out in my sleep. So I was passing out in my sleep. Oh, at times I was scared to go to sleep. So, you know, I went through a whole lot to where it's like I said, I'm just done with this. This is too much. Yep. It becomes, it becomes way too much. And then I mean, I'm, that's just diabetes. I'm not even talking about everyday life, you know, but it's, I mean, like I said, you, um, I met a, I met a, where I'm at now is now it's like, okay, I'm accepting it. I actually gave my diabetes a name, you know, because to me, diabetes is like a relationship. I named my diabetes Devin, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's a relationship. It's like, we, we gotta, you know, we gotta, um, we're in this together. You're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. I'm not going anywhere. So, Hey, let's work this out. <laughs> so, so that's a beautiful way to accept, right? So what you yeah. did was you accepted that this disease, this, this part of you that doesn't work right, it's not you, it's not your essence, it's not your spirit, it's not anything about your character, it's Devin, right? It's this other person, this other thing, and, and Devin takes up your mental space, he takes up your finances, he gets in the middle of your food and your relationships, but it's very healthy to separate your identity, right, from this disease, that's very helpful. Yeah. Not Delvin. Devin. <laughs> so, so yeah. Yeah. Devin. That's my brother. Oh. <laughs> so Devin, yes. But that's that's how I had to, you know, get to the, the point of accepting it and just embracing the diabetes. But and also uh, in my mind, it's like, you're not going to control me. I'm going to mm -hmm. con take control of my life, you know, so yep. we're going to work together. I love it. I love it. <laughs> So I'm curious that we had like a, a large number of people. So I, I guess, Chuck, I'll ask you a question. What would it have been like if somebody would have said all the stuff you were feeling was grief, right? Like if somebody would have told you like, this is going to happen to you, you lost a big part of your life and somebody would have mentored and supported and just like the compassion when someone dies, how, how loving and tolerant and we're very, we're we really embrace people when they're crazy and mad and screaming and crying. Like if they've lost someone, we understand, but if we're crazy and mad and screaming and crying, when we get diabetes, it's like, Hey, you know, it could be worse. Like people try to get us out of that mode. So there's just not a lot of compassion, but I just think they don't, no one tells you it's going to be like that. It's just take the pill, do the thing. You'll be fine. So, and that's what I was told. I was told, take the medicine, check your blood sugar, but nobody was telling me why. Nobody was telling me, this is what your body, this is what's going on with your body. Your pancreas is producing little to no insulin. You know, yep. um, nobody was explaining anything. So 
again, I mean, I, I don't want to do this. I mean, why do I have to sit here and take shots? Why do I have to prick my finger all the time, like five to eight times a day? You know, I got mad at the doctors. I was mad at the doctors for the fact that when I finally found out about a CGM, I thought they just came out with it. Found out this has been out for a long time. Why you didn't tell me about it? You see, I'm struggling. <laughs> you know, well, it's, you know, it's, it's so just, hard, right? Because people hard. just don't. They're, they we focus so much on the physiology, the outcome, the blood sugar number, like that. Yeah. You know, what's your A1C? What's your number? What's your weight? Those are the three things. Those are all the end result of all the other stuff you have to do to become engaged. So let's ask, let's ask everybody on the chat. Like as we talk through those signs and symptoms of grief, does anybody have any stories to share about how any of those signs and symptoms showed up for them? Or what you're thinking now that you hear this, do you look back and recognize that you grieved or you may still be grieving? Be curious to see what anybody has to say. So you can use the chat. I think Odessa has, a, there she is. Awesome. Yeah, it's just, I, it, it's so obvious now that I see it. And as I work with clients, it always starts with grief almost every time there's some emotional baggage that's rooted in this loss and wishing it were different and wanting it to be back then, wanting it to be the way it was, just wanting it to be different. And you have to go through those trials and tri tribulations of dealing with loss to get to acceptance. And boy, acceptance feels a lot lighter. You still have to do all this stuff, right? We still have to be mindful of all the things we have to take care of, but it just is easier when the, when the emotional baggage isn't so high. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. And, you know, I, um, I have a lot of support, you know, when it comes to the diabetes, um, and that, that, that actually helps a lot too, you know, so I have a lot of support with those who are type ones and those, you know, family and friend support as well. And that plays a really, really big part of dealing with the emotional part of diabetes. Um, Absolutely. All of that. So having a great support system helps with keeping your blood sugar under control and, and just knowing your number. You need to know your numbers at all times. Be informed, so, right? Yeah. So nobody's going to, are we not chatting? <laughs> I was hoping y'all. Nobody has any questions about nothing. There you go. Here we go. Hold on. Judith says, I've been experiencing that my doctor is pushing for insulin pump. So, um, one of the things about coming to terms with something new, so especially like an insulin pump, is if you're here and that feels like it's really, really high up here, start with what you're willing to do, right? So maybe you're willing to come on here and ask some questions. Maybe you're willing to go online and do some research. Maybe you're willing to find somebody who has a pump and you can play with it and touch it. Maybe you're willing to wear one with saline for a while. It doesn't have to be a big giant jump, right? And so sometimes when there's hard things we have to do or adjust, um, doing them in baby steps can be a little bit easier because it, and it took me a while too. Like I, they were telling me to get on a pump for a long time because I was working days and nights. I had shift work and it was crazy. And um, I was single at the time and I'm like, I don't want that on me, right? And so it was, I had this inspiration from someone else. I'm like, you know what, if she could do it, so can I, but it's a mental journey and give yourself some grace. And so as you're resistant to it, resistance is always about some feeling of fear or safety, right? Like, Ooh, I'm afraid of that because, and so when you're afraid of something, what are we afraid of? Are we afraid of rejection? Are we afraid of, and so I, even me as a nurse, when you give insulin in a hospital, you have two RNs that have to look at the syringe and compare it because we can't make a medical mistake. So then I'm going to go do this at home by myself. And then I'm going to have a machine pumping it in me 24 seven. Like that took a lot of mental gymnastics for me to get there. So give yourself some time and just try to notice what it is you're afraid of. Maybe even write a list. These are my fears. And then do some research, right? See what it is because you need the fear to go away so it feels safe. If it doesn't feel safe, you don't need extra scary on your life, right? It should be something that feels like, ooh, this is going to be good. Yeah. Let's um, see. 
I was actually, I was reading Judith's, um, her, um, her comment. And I was going to say to, to you, Judith, do you have, do you wear CGM? And um, if you do, my thing was with insulin pumps, it's, it's a mental thing. And it's something that you have to be ready for and it's something that you want to do. Like I said, I was anti-insulin pump, but I realized why I didn't like the insulin pump is because I didn't like the two. Is, okay, so yes, yeah, so if you're on a Libre, um, again, it depends on what, what you prefer. I prefer the tubeless because I didn't like the tube. But my um, insulin pump and my CGM, which, um, which is the, I'm on the Dexacon, it links together. So it, it, it talks to each other. And again, this is the best my sugar, my blood sugars have been mm -hmm. a very, very, very long time. So you have to do what you're comfortable with. This is what I'm comfortable with now. Um, but it's I like it because process, right? You don't start you know, and, and it is, it is a, a process, you know, and I like it for me because I'm a small frame. So it wears, but I mean, I, I can wear my clothes easy with it. That's, that was, that's my mind frame. I guess it just depends on where you're at, but that's where I, that's where I was. That's where I am in life now. It fits with my body right now. And I like it because it actually helps controls my blood sugars. It, it, it's better than shots to me. I couldn't, the shot thing, the measuring, uh, it, that was, that was difficult for me, you know, because you had to be giving yourself, you know, I didn't want to do the shots. That, well, let's that was talk just about that a little bit, because I think that's important that you may not know. Um, when we're talking about the pump, Judith, so with, and I would show you mine, except for it's on my backside and I don't want to stick that in the camera, um, <laughs> but it's a little sticky pod that you stick on and then you use your phone or your little, it looks like a phone. You just hit a button and it inserts the needle for you. So you don't have to stick yourself, right? It, it's, it puts a little distance, right? That perspective, it gets a little, so you don't feel like you're sticking yourself. You just put some adhesive on your skin and then you push a button and it, it does it for you. And it, it to me, it's a lot less scary. So I want to also talk about what um, Chaka was talking about, about using a pump, right? An insulin infusion pump and a CGM, continuous glucose monitor. So Omnipod and Dexcom are very com common and they talk to each other, right? And so what happens, and Judith, this may be a really nice thing for you because I'm sure without the whole pancreas and your glucagon and other things, you've got some, a lot more balance issues. But the cool thing is, as the continuous glucose monitor is reading your blood sugar, it's talking to the pump and the pump is responding, right? And so they're always kind of following each other. Um, I am not approved for that. I'm getting, that, that's coming. I, mean, I have a clinical trial thing I'm doing, so I don't have that kind of a CGM right now. But, you know, when those two things start talking, that's about the close to your pancreas as you can get right? Because it's sensing the glucose in your blood. It's adjusting the insulin to meet those needs. Um, so that might, because the Libre right now, it's not, I don't think it's approved to talk to insulin pumps. And so that might be something that works really well for you because you probably do have a little bit of, um, let's say I've been experiencing my doctor pushing the pump. Initially, it caused me stress because I felt monitored. Yeah. Um, right. So I'll just say this information is power, right? And so even if you feel monitored, that's a feeling, that's a thought, that's your perspective. So one of the easiest ways to shift is to try to try on that bargaining, a new perspective. So the perspective can be I'm curious, right? Feeling judged feels like you're under a microscope and people are looking at you and you win or lose curiosity is free and there's no expectation. So I am always curious about my blood sugar. Hmm, what happened? How did that happen? What did I eat before that made it this way? Curiosity has no heaviness to it. And so think about becoming curious about your blood sugar, becoming curious about how you will feel better if you don't have so much variation. And would that be something that would be worth the, the change? Cause it's a change. And what one of the things we're most resistant to is change. Change is also a little mini loss, right? Because it was this way and now it's going to be some new way and we have to lose that way. 
right? And so just realize too, as you think about doing something new that's scary, it's change. And I will just offer to everybody here, you're changing every minute of every day anyway. We're not the same people we were last week or two weeks ago or a year ago. Every day by watching this tonight, on some little level, you changed. You heard something, you heard a story, you got some information, maybe big, maybe little, but it changed you. And that happens to all of us each day, all the time. And so when we think we're afraid of change, just remember you're already doing it. And that is the change that you can decide on in your own time, in your own space, in your own way, right? But it, it is a personal thing. It has to be when you're ready. And Odessa's telling us we're um, wrapping up here. So let's do, um, we've got five more minutes. If anyone else has questions, feel free to put them in the chat. If you have comments, um, anything you'd like to know or talk about, happy to share that. And I'm going to offer to, once again, for those of you that joined late, um, we can do some closing comments while we're getting some, if we get any more questions, Chaka. But um, so I am doing a research study. I have an online program called My Five Step Program. So it's a video series. You watch some of the things that I've been talking about, different um, insights into what the whole process of diabetes that has very little to do with sugar and carb counting and calories, right? It's the mo the motivation, the um, the communication, all these other things that you have to figure out how to do to make your life easier. So um, I offer a course where you watch some videos and you do some workbooks. I am doing a research study because I'm going to try something new and I need some participants who would be willing to do the study with me in a group. And um, it will be for free. So I'm going to give away the course for free in exchange for feedback that you can give me. And Odessa put a link. So in the chat, there is a form that you fill out. Um, and you let me know just a few questions about where you're at and what you can do. And then um, I will figure out from everybody who's submitted who will be in the study. And then also I think she put, um, you can follow me on social or subscribe to my email. So my website is betterdiabeteslife.com. Um, it's at Better Diabetes Life for Insta and um, Facebook. And I'm on LinkedIn, all, all the major social things on there. If you go to my website, all my social links are in the footer, but um, I would love if you would like and follow. And if you would be, um, be uh, if you would consider being part of my research survey. And Chaka, you want to go ahead and share your? Um, yes, uh, Diabetic Social, we, um, we do a lot in the community. We actually have um, an event coming up April 27th. We partner up with. Nashville City Kitchen, where we do less ch uh, chow down with Chaka, and we talk about um, we talk about diabetes in your diet. And um, there, uh, the there she, um, she D, which is D, she cooks the, the food and stuff. She cook up different like diabetic like dishes and stuff. And everything's free. You come out for the tasting, and we'll discuss like just different, you know, different things. I always have like some diabetic tips. And stuff like that. We um, check your blood sugar because to me it's so important that you know your number. So we do like blood sugar checking before and afterwards so you can see how food affects your blood sugar. Right. So we do have that going on. April 27th is from 6 to 8 at Nashville City Kitchen here in Nashville for those who are in Nashville. Um, so again, you can go to my website. We um, I have listed everything that we're doing in the community. Um, on a monthly basis. Um, also, my social media platforms are there. We have um, Instagram, Facebook. So if you can like and follow, we'd appreciate it. But I really do appreciate everyone who did come out to the. Yeah. Yeah. This was fun. Thank you so much. I know we kind of threw a lot at you. The hour went by so fast. It did. Fast. It did. Yeah. So um, you have our contact information. Please reach out, um, follow us on social, and check things out. And uh, yeah, if you, and here's an idea. If you have another topic that you'd like us to talk about, maybe we can do another one of these in the future. So That'd be great. Thank, I will just say, I'll sign off and say thank you so much for joining and be well. Yes, thank you again. And remember, don't let diabetes take control of your life. You take control of your diabetes. Absolutely. Devin. Devin, <laughs> yes. Devin. <laughs> He's being good right now. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you all, right. all so much. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.